Hey, great to see you. Thank you so much for joining The Crossing Online. I don't know about you, have you ever asked why do bad things happen to good people? I know that I have, but if you've ever asked that question, we're going to wrestle with that today. And so I would invite you to stick around. We are going to have the band play some songs and be able to worship together. And then we're going to wrestle with that question. Uh, and I think the Apostle John does a great job of actually answering that in a sign that Jesus manufactured for you and for me to see. So stick with us and I will see you on the other end. To the hands of sin, or oh, crippled by the shame within, or oh, broken heart and restless soul, I was lost out on the open road, oh, beaten on that bloody day. Oh, clinging to that cursed tree, oh, Jesus bled and died for me, Jesus bled and died for me, yeah. Victory, victory, conquer death, set me free, victory, victory, oh, Jesus alive in Days on the stone gives way. Ain't nothing but an empty grave. Gather all the sinners round. Tell them what great love we found. Tell them what great love we Jesus alive in me, victory, victory, conquer death, set me free, victory, victory, oh Jesus alive in me, oh Jesus alive in me, two, three, four, five. Yeah. 
Hey Crossing, so during this time of our service right now, normally we would move into our time of offering, uh, but we're not exactly gonna ask you to pass baskets around your living room. You can if you really want to, uh, but I would encourage you to give during this time. Um, just because we're in uh, quarantine and doing all those different things doesn't mean our ministry here as a church stops. Uh, we're still on a day-to-day -day basis trying to find ways that we can give and help others uh, and still do ministry because the goal of seeing people meet, follow, and love Jesus doesn't stop when there's a virus going around. So we're continuing to do things uh, and we're continuing to serve and do what God has called us to do as a church. Uh, so I would encourage you to give during this time. There's a couple different ways that you can do that. Uh, the first way, you could mail a check to us at PO Box 17. Uh, just write down the address that we have here on the screen and you can uh, just send a check to us that way. Uh, another way that you can give is text to give. So just text any amount to this number here and uh, that'll come to us as well. And if you want to, you can go online to thecrossingfellowship.com slash give. And that will uh, take you to a place where you can either set up a recurring payment to give online or just do a one-time gift, uh, whatever works for you and how you can give that way. Uh, and then one thing that I would challenge you to do, if you're normally one of the people that uh, on a Sunday morning when the baskets come around and you can drop the cash in the basket or uh, drop it in the basket on the way out, uh, I would challenge you and encourage you to still give. 
uh, whether you're passing an envelope around your living room and you uh, put all the cash in there and then at the end of service you count out how much it is and then write a check for that amount and mail it to us or uh, you throw your money in a pot and then you uh, decide how much to give online based off of that. Whatever you choose to do, I would encourage you to give during this time, uh, even though we're not able to meet together. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we went through a finance series talking about how uh, we need to be putting God first in our lives and putting God first in our finances. So Crossing, I would really challenge you during this time to put God first in your finances and to give. Uh, whether that's giving to us directly as a church or finding other ways that you can be open-handed with your finances and what God has blessed you with uh, in order to give and help your neighbors or other people that are in need during this time. Uh, but whatever it is you choose to do, however it is you choose to give, uh, remember to put God first with your finances. Hey, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining in. We are in part six of our series, Bystanders. And in this series, we've been following the Apostle John as he has been laying out the signs that he saw that made him come to the conclusion that Jesus was who he said he was. And uh, a question that all of us have asked, and, and it's a question I know that I've asked, and I'm sure that it's a question that you have asked, that really wrestles at the heart and kind of makes us think, how can there be a good God and yet allow bad things to happen? So have you ever asked the question, why would a good God allow bad things to happen? I mean, how can there be a good God and, and, and it allows evil in the world? And maybe this is where you got off the ship. Maybe this is where you either lost faith or you never entertained faith because you just could not... You could not wrestle and, and, and bring those two things, those two ideas uh, together. And, and as a result, you just lost faith. Or maybe you just couldn't ever cross the line of faith because you couldn't ever reconcile those two things. And I know that I've asked the question, but here's what I find interesting. When we entertain this question, uh, we always ask it in regards to everything that's bad out there. And so I want to kind of reference it maybe in a different way and maybe in a way that you haven't thought about it before. So I just want to ask, have you ever done anything bad? Have you done anything bad? And I would imagine the answer to that is yes. And if you're wondering, I would just ask your spouse real quick. You know, ask your children. Children, ask your parents. I mean, it doesn't take very long for us to say, well, yeah, I've done some things bad. But see, when we ask these questions, how, how can there be a good God and yet allow bad things to happen? It's always the bad things out there. It's never the bad things in here. See, have you ever considered, how could a good God allow me to happen? You say, well, wait, wait a second. I mean, no, I'm talking about the bid, bad things out there. I mean, not, not the things in here. I mean, again, if God was good, he would have done something about me by now. Right? I mean, if, if that's the standard and, and you start going down that road and you start thinking about those things, pretty soon you're in the realm of, well... How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? 
right? I mean, you start following that down to its path, and you try to reconcile those two things, and, and you think it's just the bad things out there, and, and not me, it's not the bad things in here, and you can't really reconcile those two things. You come to what we call an unfalsifiable premise. An unfalsifiable premise lead you to the end in its logical end. And here's the thing, we never get to the logical end, and we never get to the logical end because it's so emotional. It's so emotional that we, we never even rationally think about it to its end. But if you bring it to its end, basically what you're saying is an unfalsifiable premise that says, I don't believe God exists because I exist. And if I didn't exist, then... God could convince me that he was good, but since I don't exist, it's a little hard for him to convince me. It's an unfalsifiable premise. And I think the Apostle John, if he entered into our conversation and when we're trying to reconcile these things, and he would say, you know what? You can wrestle and wrestle and wrestle, and you'll probably never, ever be able to reconcile those two things. But he would say, hey, I want to tell you something because I saw something. I saw God in a body exist, coexist with evil side by side. And, and, and he didn't try to disprove or prove himself through getting rid of, of, of evil. In fact, he didn't try to get rid of me. And he didn't even try to get rid of the evil in me. He loved me. And after he loved me, then he started working on eradicating the bad things in me. And John would say, you know what? There's a story that I would love to share with you. And in this story, it, it, it allows you to be able to see how a good God existed alongside evil. And John would say, I watched with my own eyes evil that you couldn't even imagine. And, and plagues that you wouldn't even imagine in the middle of the coronavirus and the things that we are watching, John would say, I watched some of the things and they didn't have the technology that you have. And it was bad. And in the middle of that, I watched a good God coexist alongside with evil. So in this story, to kind of set it up, Jesus keeps going up north into Galilee, and then he would come down south into Judea and to Jerusalem, and he'd go to the temple. And whenever he went there, it was kind of trouble because he would get with the religious leaders, and the religious leaders, they had willful blindness, what we talked about last week. They, there was something to see, but they just didn't want to see it, so they predecided what they believed, and they weren't going to budge. And, and so there just was this conflict between them and the religious leaders, and it was kind of dangerous down there. And, uh, and so Jesus kind of kept going back and forth, and he's down in Jerusalem, and the people, it says in, 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 in John, um, verse 24 and 10, 24, he says, the people surrounded him and asked, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Well, Jesus replied, I've already told you, and you don't believe me. The proof is in the work I do in my Father's name. And so Jesus says, I told you, but you don't believe me. In fact, it's better than I told you. I showed you. I, I showed you, and yet you still don't believe. And so in the middle of this, they get cantankerous, and it gets really heated, and pretty soon they're going to stone Jesus but Jesus and his guys, they're able to get away and they go back up north, two days walk north of Jerusalem. And it's there that Jesus decides, I'm going to manufacture a sign that will prove that I am who I say I am. And in this sign, it, it gives us an idea of all the future generations of how a good God exists alongside the bad things that we see in this world. And it is nothing like you may think. So, <clears throat> we pick it up in John chapter 11, verse 1. A man named Lazarus was sick. 
He lived in Bethany with his sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, Bethany was about a day's walk north of Jerusalem, and so Jesus is two days up, and, uh, and, and this family was great friends with Jesus. Jesus was, they were, they, they were super good friends with one another. And so Mary and Martha, they found out where Jesus was, and they send a messenger to Jesus because Jesus' great friend Lazarus was deathly ill. So the two sisters sent a message to Jesus telling him, Lord, your dear friend is very sick. But when Jesus heard about it, he said, Lazarus' sickness will not end in death. Huh. Oh, well that, that's fantastic news. I mean, that's great. And so the messenger, he turns around and he heads on back, thinking, you know what? Jesus doesn't have to come. Lazarus is going to get well. No big deal. And Jesus' disciples are like, whew. Good, because we didn't want to go back down to Judea, because the last time we were down there, we almost died. So we don't want to go back down there. So this is great news. It's not, gonna, it's not as bad as everyone thought. Perfect. It's not going to end in death. And then Jesus finishes, no, it happened for the glory of God, so that the Son of God will receive glory from this. Okay, time out. Say what? Jesus, are, are you saying that you believe bad things can happen to good people and it doesn't disprove God? In fact, it's for his glory? Are, are you saying, Jesus, that, that, sickness, that sickness can happen to Jesus-loving friends? In fact, one of your best friends. The sickness could happen to one of your best friends and it's happening for the glory of God? This might be a brand new category. Jesus introduces a brand new category for you and for me. That sickness for the glory of God. And Jesus manufactures this sign. And in some ways it was it was excruciating for Mary and Martha, but it was fantastic, and it is fantastic news for you and for me and for all future generations. So although Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, he stayed where he was for the next two days. So John is thinking, you know what? <clears throat> I should probably pause because everyone's thinking, sickness for the glory of God? Are you kidding me? I mean, does Jesus even love these people? Because it doesn't seem like he loves them. And so John's like, maybe I should remind people that he loved these folks. And it seemed like maybe, you know, he didn't love him. So he always wanted to remind us that he does love him. And sometimes for you, Sometimes for you, you wonder if Jesus loves you. You see the sickness around, and you see the, the bad things and the evil in the world, and, and maybe some of the circumstances that are happening in your world right now, maybe some job loss, maybe some financial uncertainty, maybe some health uncertainty, maybe just uncertainty of everything that's going on in the world, and you're wondering, does Jesus love you? Does Jesus know? Could it? be for the glory of God and could God's glory shine through everything that we are experiencing right now and so John says Jesus stayed where he was for the next two days he's thinking I'm not going to go back down south now by this time the messenger had made his way back home to find out that Lazarus had actually died while he was on his way up north to Bethany, or up north to where Jesus was. And, and he shows up and Lazarus is dead. He had to tell Mary and Martha that Jesus said this wasn't going to end in death, and he's dead. So where in the world is Jesus? What's going on? How, how do you reconcile good God and, and this, this thing? And this is a friend of Jesus by... I mean, good grief, what... What is going on? Well, finally, 
he said to his disciples, Jesus says to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. Well, his disciples didn't want to go because they're like, we're going to die. If we go back down south, it, it's not going to be good. I mean, it is heated down there. They, they do not want to see us down there. So his disciples tried to talk him out of it. His disciples objected. Rabbi, they said, only a few days ago, the people in Judea were trying to stone you. And <clears throat> since they're going to try and stone you, guess who else <laughs> they're going to stone? Us. We're not really interested in getting stoned. So I'll tell you what. You know what? Maybe you could go down there by yourself. Maybe, you know, but do you want? Do you, we don't really want to go down there. Are you going to go down there again, they asked? And Jesus replied. And Jesus does, Jesus does what Jesus always does. And if, and if you're a skeptic of, of the Scriptures, you're not sure about the Bible, or you think someone just kind of got in a room and, and wrote it, it's things like this that Jesus did over and over and over again that were so off script that they would never write it this way. That I think this substantiates that, you know what? This is the way it happens, and this is John's account. And Jesus replied, there are 12 hours of daylight every day. Oh, oh, thank you. During the day, people can walk safely. They can see because they have the light of the world. Well, that's nice, Jesus. What in the world does that have to do with anything? I, I, we, don't, we don't understand. And Jesus goes on, but at night, there is danger of stumbling. Because they have no light. <laughs> I think Jesus, is, the guy, his disciples are just like, there you go. There you go again. You're always doing that where we have no idea what in the world it is you're talking about. And we read it now, and we're after the fact, and sometimes we don't even know what he was talking about, right? But as this sign unfolded, the point of what Jesus is saying here is so clear. To say, guys, guys, you can stay here. You can stay here, but you just need to know you are in the physical presence of the light of the world. And while you have the light of the world and you are in his physical presence, you should pay attention. Because if you don't go with me in the next few hours, in the next 12 hours, you are going to experience something that will change the world forever. And so you could stay up here, but you just need to know the light of the world is in the world, but he's not going to be in the world for very long, and he's going to leave. And when the light of this world leaves, it is going to be dark in this world. So he says, if you stay here, you will miss the light of the world interact you're going to miss him interacting with the with nature in such a way that it will change the world forever if you stay up here you're going to miss something that is going to change everything you're not going to see with your own eyes something that 2000 years later people are still going to be talking about see if you choose not to follow the light of the world you will stumble around in darkness and it will be a world that has no meaning. And you'll never figure out good and evil. If you never embrace the author of life, you will never truly have life. And life will never truly make sense to you. And you will never be able to reconcile good and evil. And you will you'll never be able to figure out if there was a good God. And how can a good God and evil exist at the same time? You're going to wrestle with it and wrestle with it and wrestle with it. Apart from the author of life, you'll never understand life. And at its end, I think Richard Dawkins is right. If, if you just stumble around and you do not embrace the light of the world, then at its end, I think Richard Dawkins is right. He says, there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. When we don't embrace the author of life, when we don't recognize the light of the world, 
and you bring that to its bottom, you will never be able to reconcile and you will never figure out what this life truly was about. Well, Jesus goes on. Then he said, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but now I will go and wake him up. (laughs) His disciples are thinking, Well, that's a lousy reason to risk our lives. Why would we go down there and wake him up? If he's sleeping, that's a good thing. So his disciples give him some medical advice. He said, Lord, they say, Lord, if he is sleeping, that's a good thing. That means his fever is probably broken. He's sleeping. He's going to get better. He will soon get better. <laughs> and so Jesus is probably rolling his eyes, and finally he just tells them plainly, guys, Lazarus is dead. Well, time out. Jesus, you just said this wasn't gonna, it wasn't going to end in death. And you're telling us he's dead? What's up with that? And Jesus is manufacturing a sign for you and for me. And then Jesus says something that I tell you what is, it, it, it's, it's so extraordinary. He says, and for your sakes, I'm glad. I'm glad I wasn't there. For your sakes, Jesus says, I'm glad I wasn't there. In the middle of Martha's agony and Mary's agony and, 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 and their sorrow and their grief and their brokenness and their, and their faith being shaken and their anger at God of, of, and towards Jesus saying, you could have been here Understanding they are going through sorrow and grief in the worst time that they could possibly think of. And Jesus says, I'm glad I wasn't there for your sake. I am manufacturing a sign for you. And for the sake of every parent that has ever buried a child. And for the sake of a husband who has ever buried his wife. And for every wife who has buried her husband. And for every child who's had to bury a parent or parents way, way too early. For the sakes of all of us who would say, hmm, how does a good God coexist with evil? And Jesus is unfolding a sign that brings the solution for sin Sorrow and death in one afternoon. Verse 15, and for your sakes, I'm glad I wasn't there. For now, you will really believe. Come, let's go see him. Well, Thomas, (laughs) Thomas, nicknamed the twin, said to his fellow disciples, well, I guess we'll go. And die with Jesus, because that's what's going to happen. This is not going to end well. We don't want to go. I know, I know the ending of this. It's not going to go well. So, but, hey, let's go with Jesus. We'll die too. <laughs> well, when Jesus arrived at Bethany, he was told that Lazarus had already been in his grave for four days. Four days. And then Jesus meets up with Martha. And in this conversation, we see some things that I know that I have felt at times, and I would presume that you have as well. When Martha got the word that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed in the house. And Mary probably stayed in the house because she was upset with him. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if only you had been here. You're late. You're so late. If only you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, this is partly your fault. How could you let this happen? I I, I thought that you loved him. I, I, I thought that you would come running. Why did you tell the messenger that this wouldn't end in death, and yet it did? 
we're so confused. I, I'm so upset. I, I mean, I, I love you, and, and I, I'm, I'm following you, but I don't understand. And Martha, in this moment, if you have ever been at a time when your faith is kind of shaken and, 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 and you're wondering if you can cry out to God and be honest with Him, Martha is giving you permission to be honest because she just can't wrap her mind around why Jesus would allow this to happen. <laughs> and Jesus says, but even now, or Martha said, but even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus, I don't understand it. I don't understand the why. I, I, I'm upset. I'm, I, I'm torn. But in the middle of it, I just am going back to what I know. That God will give you whatever you ask. So Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. <laughs> well, Martha is thinking that Jesus is giving her like preacher talk or religious person. You ever had someone in the middle, in the middle of, of your grief, you had something terrible happen, and in the middle of your grief, um, religious people who mean well show up and they have a verse they want to share with you or they have a DVD they want to share with you or they have some, and you're just like, I don't really want that right now. I, I am the, I'm in the middle of pain and sorrow and suffering. I, I just don't want, and so Martha's thinking Jesus is just kind of giving her some theology. <laughs> Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Yes, Martha said, he will rise. I've been to synagogue. I know how it goes. I know the theology when everyone else rises at the last day. And then Jesus says, Martha, I'm not giving you theology. In fact, I'm not, even, I'm not even correcting your theology. Martha, I I am giving you not even a category. I am giving you myself. Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. You are staring at him. It's not a category. It's me. And if you want resurrection and you want life, it is found in me, the author of life. Jesus manufactures a sign to not only to be able to communicate to Mary and Martha, but to be able to communicate for every future generation, to be able to communicate to you, and to me, who the resurrection and life is and where it is found. It is not found in a category. It is not found in a church building somewhere. It is found in a person, the person of Jesus. The most important question you could ever ask in your entire life is who is Jesus? Is he the resurrection and life? If he is, then he is worth putting your trust in. Anyone, Jesus says, who believes in me will live even after dying. Anyone who believes in, anyone, th this Greek word is, it, it's not to believe that there was a guy named Jesus, it was put your trust in. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never ever die. Martha, Martha, Jesus, do you believe this? See, Jesus gives us a, a glimpse that, you know what? Death is just simply a door. It is simply a transition to another life. And then he says, Martha, do you believe me? Do you believe this? And Martha in struggling to understand and we struggle to understand and what little faith she had at that moment she expresses that yes jesus i 
I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. I believe that you're the Messiah. I don't understand it all. But I've come to a place that I, I don't have to understand everything to believe something. I have seen too much. <laughs> and so Jesus, he asks where they put him. In verse 34, where have you put him, he asked. And they told him, the Lord, Lord, come and see. And as he's going, Jesus in his, in his humanity, and he's fully God and fully man, and, and in the humanity part, he's, he's entering into the grief because he's watching as all of the friends of Mary and Martha in this, this well-to-do family that had lots of friends, and they were coming from Jerusalem to console them and and Jesus is watching all of the grief and the sadness and the sorrow and he's entering into that heaven entering into the earth and the sorrow and the pain that we feel and it says Jesus wept he broke down the sorrow and the pain that we feel in this life because of sin just grieved him to the point where he broke down and wept. He came to the tomb, and the people who were standing there nearby said, well, see how much he loved him? But some said, this man healed a blind man. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Isn't that where we are? Isn't that where we live? I mean, there's some that are like, well, he obviously loved them, and some are like, he obviously had the power to do something, but he didn't do it. If he had the power to do something, why didn't he do this? And if, if you've gone to the kitchen to get something to eat, if you're, whatever it is that you're doing, if you're away, I, I need you to come back. I need you to come back, and I need you to tune in. Because this, this is so huge, so powerful. You see, at this moment, at this moment, Jesus condenses our entire lives into a single afternoon. He condenses our entire lives and condenses it down to a single afternoon. Our lives that are filled with some pain. Our lives that are filled with sorrow. Our lives that are filled with fear. Our lives that are filled with anger. Anger towards some other people. Anger maybe sometimes towards God. Why? You could have, but you didn't. Unanswered prayer. Faith anyway, in the middle of it, I, I'm holding on to faith in the middle of it, even though I don't understand it. Tears of God, the empathy and the, the compassion that God has towards us. And finally, the resolution. <laughs> and Jesus, in, in one afternoon, condenses our entire life experience. And then he says, roll the stone aside. But Martha, the dead man's sister, she's like, ah. she protested, Lord, Lord, you're so late. You're so late. He's been in there four days. Do you have any idea how bad it's going to smell? <laughs> and Jesus says, didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believe? And he tells you, and he tells me, if you believe, you will see God's glory. And I know what you're saying, because I say it too. Well, I want to see it right now. That's the point of the story. To see, if we believe, we are going to see with our own eyes God's glory, the resolution, the solution for sin, sorrow, and death. And that death is just simply a door, a transition. So they rolled the stone aside. Then Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. 
You always hear me, but I said it out loud for the sake of these people standing here. Why? Because I'm manufacturing a sign so that they will, what? Believe. Which is exactly what John is wanting us, his audience, to do. That you sent me. Then Jesus shouted, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound in grave clothes, his face wrapped in headcloth. And Jesus told them, unwrap him and let him go. And then John records something that I think is pretty obvious, but he probably had to write her down anyway. And it is the equation for us. He says, many of the people who were there, who were with Mary, believed. Oh, I bet they did. <laughs> After seeing this, Many of the people who were with Mary believed in Jesus when they saw this happen. There's John's equation. Believed in, put their trust in. Why did they put their trust in? Because they saw with their own eyes. John isn't asking you. Jesus isn't asking you. He manufactures a sign. Not just a miracle that was a standalone thing. The miracle was actually a sign to show you and to show me clear evidence that Jesus was who he said he was. After this, the place just went nuts. Some people went back up to Jerusalem, told the Pharisees, the religious leaders, what happened. And they're just like, that's it. Everyone's going to start believing in Jesus if we let this go on any further. And so they figured out a way to arrest him, and they did so. And then they crucified the Lamb of God. And in so doing, they provided the solution for sin and death, a perfect sacrifice. And they also executed Lazarus. You see, John would step back and say, I, I watched as good God, God in a body, existed alongside evil. And he didn't try to get rid of evil to prove that he was God. Instead, he chose to love me, even though there was some evil inside of me. And then provided a way the solution for the thing that is plaguing me and is plaguing all of us today. And the sign that Jesus produced wasn't just, you know, pain that was inflicted from one person to another. It was, it was the pain of nature. It was nature inflicting that we're watching right now in our world. And Jesus brought the solution to the thing that is plaguing all of mankind right now. And then he would ask you, do you believe? Because I am the resurrection and the life. And anyone who believes in me will have life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever would believe in him, would not perish, would not be lost to God, but would have everlasting life. Would you pray with me? If right now you are watching this and the Holy Spirit has, has done something in your heart and you just don't know what to do with it, I'm going to invite you to pray this with me and express your heart towards God. God, I, I, don't, I confess I don't understand it all. But I've come to a place where I, I, I do understand. I don't have to understand everything to believe something. And I believe the evidence is clear. And so right now, I, I declare that I trust you, Jesus. I am placing my faith in you. I am asking you for forgiveness of my sin. And I'm going to ask you to give me the Spirit of God to live in me. 
Thank you for the forgiveness of sin. Help me to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you, I would love it, love it, love it. If you would get a hold of us at the Crossing Fellowship at gmail.com, you can email us, you can text me. Just, I would love to hear if you have placed your faith in Jesus today. Thank you so much for joining me. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, shame no longer has a place to hide, and I am not captive to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind No, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken yeah. Cause my fear it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I Doesn't stand a chance when I'm standing in your love. Oh, oh, oh. oh, there's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out a grave. Yeah, there's resurrection power that can. Hey, thank you so much for joining in with me today. If, if that message resonated with you, I would love to interact with you about that. And uh, you could do that if you wanted to email me at ejmost at gmail.com, or you can just send me a message on Facebook. I would love, love, love to interact with you around that if you had questions about that. And I would pay attention as we are sending out the uh, PDF uh, link for the discussion questions would love for you to sit around with your group or your family, uh, even maybe as a couple or just by yourself, to be able to contemplate through the discussion questions uh, that we will provide for you. Crossing, uh, I did want to let you know about Easter, and you know what? It is a huge bummer for me um, not to be able to, to meet in the Life Center and see all of you. Another thing that we had thought about doing was going to the Avenue M ground and gathering up there and I know 
From the outside looking in, it seems like that would be a simple thing that we could all do, but the logistics of all of it, um, from the, uh, the background of everything that it would take to put all of that together, it is just not feasible. And so Easter is going to be at our time that we are having at 1030 um, next week. And so I would just, here's what I would love for you to do. If you um, stream off of the uh, original Crossing Facebook page, there you will find uh, where you can click and have a watch party. Would you, would you be willing to do that as you're watching to have a watch party? It invites all of your friends on Facebook to watch with you and uh, is a fantastic way for you to invest and invite. So uh, we'll encourage you to do that. And then something special that I would love to do, even though we can't see each other, uh, in person, I would love for you for us to be able to see one another in a way that we could do that. If you would take a short video of you and your family just waving at the camera saying hi to the crossing, uh, and then email that to the crossing fellowship at gmail.com, then Jafili will put a collage together so that we could all see one another um, in our service next week. So, crossing. Have a fantastic week. Continue to love, continue to pray. Continue to pray, continue to see where you might be able to reach out and help others. And then let us know if there's some things that uh, you would want us to be praying for specifically for you and uh, any needs that we might have as well. And we will continue to send out things that come across to us that you could be a part of. So, Crossing, thank you for being the church as we continue on our mission of seeing people meet, follow, and love Jesus.